Aloha! Today, what's bugging you? I want to talk about insects. Uh, I've spent uh, a life learning about horticulture, but along the line I realize that it isn't possible to be a good horticulturalist unless you got a little bit of education in entomology. Why? Because insects, the subject of entomology, just love to eat plants. In fact, they've been eating plants long before there were any people on the face of the planet. So the relationships between insects and plants, insects and insects, insects and funguses, insects and diseases, and on and on and on. These relationships are all very, very ancient, very well defined, and they're extremely intricate. And the reason I'm here today to talk about it is that in my business over the years of selling people products to control problems on plants, I've noticed that there is a distinct lack of understanding of exactly how intricate these systems are. People see bug, want kill bug, no bug, bug eat plant, stomp! You know, it's kind of like... What do you mean they ban that stuff? Can't I get spent nuclear fuel rods? You know. So, it brings up what I call the green thumb, brown thumb gardener rule. It's the 80-20 that the brown thumb gardener is 80% action but only 20% observation and analysis. And the green thumb gardeners are all 80% observation and analysis with only 20% action, if even that much. And the more you understand about the relationships between different insects, the more you understand that, the less likely you will be to approach uh, pest problems in your garden with a heavy-handed insecticide or some other type of approach that might be a uh, broad spectrum, you know. Because, like I say, these relationships are so intricate and there's so much variation in insects, and so we have, if you have an insect that eats your plant, you also have some insect that eats that insect, or you have some other insect that's a parasite of that insect, and so on. I mean, this stuff gets really strange. Um, I only recently, only recently realized that uh, the parasitic wasps that lay eggs in caterpillars um, the, these wasps actually take over the caterpillar's brain somehow. So the caterpillar will guard and defend the wasp eggs that have literally killed the caterpillar. Uh, you know, I know, I understand a lot of you folks find this stuff to be kind of gross. Um, I, you know, I guess I had my day about that too. But uh, as time moves on, I realize just how incredible these, these uh, relationships are. Uh, I'm just amazed by them. I'm no longer particularly grossed out by what happens from bug to bug. Um, I, as a child, it was my mother who started me understanding uh, how deep these relationships are. I'd be in the garden and I'd walk out and find a great big orb weaver, golden garden spider, with a huge web up in the corner of the garden, you know. And I go, oh, Mom, look, there's a giant spider in the garden. What are we going to do, you know? Should we get rid of it? As a little boy, I'd say this. Well, Mom would say, uh-uh, nope, 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 the uh, garden spider, he's the guardian of this garden. And uh, they're going to catch other bugs that might have come in and helped destroy the crops. And so you leave that spider alone. I'd often find our spider disappear anyway because they are kind of uh, easy prey for birds. Birds will pull the orb weavers right out of the middle of those webs. And it's always sad when I find the empty web and no weaver anymore. But that was where it started. And I recall being in the garden in Illinois uh, with my mother when I was about 11 years old. And we had an infestation of tomato hornworms. That's that big four-finger-sized green worm with the barb at the end of the tail, you know. And they're even gross to pick up because, man, do they wriggle. And they actually try to bite. They do a pretty good jaw. I mean, they can munch a tomato plant real fast. Anyway, we would go out, and rather than using insecticides, Mom would pick up the worms, put them in a bucket of kerosene or something, and get rid of them, uh, or stomp them, rather than uh, uh, trying to spray for the worms. And, uh, well, we were picking worms, and all of a sudden I came up with one that had 
little white cottony cocoon like egg case things all over the top of it and I went mom what's with this and so she comes and looks and says oh don't kill that worm and I, huh what do you mean don't kill that worm well these egg cases here these are parasitic wasp pupa and so uh, the wasp has laid eggs in this caterpillar and this caterpillar is going to hatch out into a whole bunch more little tiny fruit fly sized wasps that are going to kill a whole lot more worms and so if you leave that worm to survive it will control more of the worms next time around well this was news to me i didn't have any idea that it was that intricate and i guess mom's gone now i can't even ask her where mom where did you learn that stuff anyway because um you know, she really didn't have a, a an education in etymology. I, I don't know. Anyway, that's where I got it initially. And uh, so just the other day I was harvesting kale out in our garden. And when I brought it in to clean it, I found a green worm, an omnivorous leaf roller, was in that kale. And uh, the worm didn't look too healthy. It was alive, but I could see where he's bleeding slightly. Um, like, he's been pierced and I've started thinking oh this worm might have had uh, um, you know eggs from a parasitic wasp embedded in it that's why it doesn't look too good then as I unrolled the leaf just a little more just a little further in the leaf what I found was a whole bunch of cottony pupas little tiny pupas now I was familiar with seeing this site before on the caterpillars I have never seen it separate from the caterpillars with the caterpillar in close contact this again was more parasitic wasps, say fruit fly size, they have an ovipositor. They would lay eggs into the caterpillar and the larva would hatch out in the caterpillar and I guess consume part of it along the line. But somehow or another it would cause the caterpillar to guard the pupas of this of this uh, wasp and so when the wasp uh, pupas uh, emerge they'd make these they pupate in these little white cottony cocoon looking things right next to the caterpillar and the caterpillar was laying there slowly dying away uh, guarding over these wasp pupas when I found it well we took the wasp pupas and we put them into a jar and we waited and sure enough sooner or later a whole bunch of little black fruit fly sized wasps come out and uh, um, they uh, we set them free in the yard over here but I had actually never watched the entire process nor I had ever seen it where the caterpillar is next to the pupas usually the pupas are on the caterpillar and when we looked it up, we found out that this is mind control by wasps. The caterpillars give up doing everything else but guarding the wasp pupa. Well, that type of parasitic wasp behavior is extremely common. And I know every time I say wasp, everybody goes, oh, wasp, oh, wasp, wasp. And they think of these, you know, yellow jackets or European hornets or something and getting stung and getting messed with the barbecue. No. Mm -mm. Ah, well, over 90% of all the wasps on Earth have no interest in human beings. And so many of them are really about fruit fly sized. And so you hardly even know they're there. You don't realize that we're surrounded by these creatures all the time. And this is where knowing a little entomology, so when you're looking at things, you can see what's actually happening, not what you think is happening. Um, the same type of a wasp will also consume aphids. They consume scale insects, for instance. Um, if you go and you look at a, uh, a concentration of aphids on a rose bush or on a cabbage shoot or something, and you have all these aphids there, if you look hard at them, oftentimes what you're going to find is that some of those aphids are what we call mummies. The aphids will be little puffed up brassy shells, and a lot of times they'll have a little door cut in them that even may have popped open, circular door. Those aphids were parasitized by a wasp, and the larva grew up inside the aphid and then consumed the aphid and cut its way out and left. And you'll have the mummies of these aphids stuck in the colonies. Well, if you go out and you see aphids and you go, oh, I'm going to spray something safe like insecticidal soap, which would work on the aphids, or maybe even you're just going to take a garden hose and blow them all off the leaf, which, I mean, how innocuous can you get, right? But before you do such a thing, you really want to look and see, 
is this colony parasitized? And if the colony has wasp parasites, you're really better off if you just leave it alone for nature to take its course, since you, the aphids are not going to decimate and, and destroy your rose bush or your cabbage, uh, generally. Um, and if you allow these intricate cycles to continue, you'll have more defense from the natural environment, because if you take an insecticide, especially a very heavy-handed one, go out and go, aphids, spray, kill. Well, now you're all on your own. You have no more help from nature anymore when you've done something like that. Generally speaking, um, the pest creatures will rebound very quickly within a few days from the applications of an insecticide, but the parasite or the predator creatures that prey on these things can take weeks to years to recover from one single insecticide application. Really, this is true. These are university studies. University of California, you know, they realized they were creating mite epidemics in the citrus groves by spraying for the mites. When they stopped spraying for the mites, the numbers of mites declined because eventually the number of parasites and predators increased. Um, now, the other observation I have made, and that is that we have people who will have a, see an aphid problem on a rose bush, for instance, and come to me when I ran a nursery and say, oh, Bill, I need to buy ladybugs. I need ladybugs, or I need lace wings, or something. Uh, that these are natural controls that will work against aphids, you know. But they don't work like insecticides. <laughs> I have never, ever once seen somebody release ladybugs into a problem and have that release take care of that specific problem the same way an insecticide will okay um, and so nature is never a complete control if ladybugs or lace wings or parasitic wasps controlled all the aphids a hundred percent well they wouldn't have any food would they and so it's essential. You must have pests on plants if you want predators and parasites. Um, this is a strange thing, but yeah, you got to be somewhat tolerant to the pest bugs in order to have good populations uh, of things that control them. And you need to use an approach that you're hopefully hitting the pest at the point when they are not full of parasites or predators. Because, you know, if you hit them while the ladybug larvas are all over the colony, well, man, you killed a lot of ladybugs that were going to do a lot of good work, and it's probably going to take them a long time to recover from that. Yet the aphids will be back in three days. Okay. That's just the nature of the game. Um, so when we're using natural predator insects and we're actually introducing them ourselves by buying them and putting them into the site... It's a very complicated process. It's not just, you no, know, dump some ladybugs on the rose bush and aphid problem solved. No, it's not like that. Um, for one, you got to put the bugs out in the evening. Otherwise, they just fly. All right. And so you want them to go to sleep on the plants. This is important. You want the plants to be really well watered with literally liquid on the leaves so when the ladybugs wake up in the morning they have something to drink so they want to stay around and so if they find aphids on the plant and if they find water to drink it's a pretty good chance that a lot of them are going to stay around they're going to mate and then they're going to go ahead and lay eggs on your roses for instance in the aphid colonies so that you do get larvae that hatch out now an adult ladybug eats probably about as much nectar from flowers as it actually eats, say, aphids. But a larva ladybug doesn't eat flower nectar. It eats bugs, bug eggs. It's totally, uh, you know, an insectivore. And so it's the larva that do most of the control. So it means you have to have ladybugs that want to breed and stay in your garden to create larva so that you'll get some control. Well, as I said, the adults, they want nectar. So you got to have lots of flowers around. You know, things like thyme is a real good one for ladybugs. They like lavender. Um, there's a number of carrot family. They love the carrot family, nectar. Uh, you know, that would be dill, fennel, um, parsley, cilantro. Uh, they love the nectar from the carrots. And so 
you know, if you have carrot family around the yard, then the adults have stuff to feed on. They also seem to like tall, grassy type things because when they do breeding, they like to climb up on top of a piece of grass and go, yeah, woo, ha, ha, look at me. You know, <clears throat> it's part of the ritual. And so if you mow everything flat, well, I don't have any place to climb. And so this is a very complicated situation. And you really have to create environmental habitat if you want predators and parasites. You also have to be savvy to know what does a cluster of ladybug eggs look like? What does a ladybug larva look like? A, what does a ladybug look like? Because there are so many different kinds and most of them don't even look like the you know red with the black spot the current lady beetle that we're all familiar with there are gray ones with black spots you get uh, um, shiny black ones that look dusty with red heads here in hawaii we have the blue lady beetle our most common ladybug is uh, a metallic blue bug uh, no spots and the larva of that bug, instead of being the sort of pinkish, orangish color of the usual ladybug, little armadillo larvas, uh, he's blue. That's a blue bug. It looks a lot the same. <clears throat> Which brings me to a story about the crypt beetle. Um, the crypt beetle is a form of ladybug. We have it here in Hawaii. It's uh, very common in California on the West Coast. I suspect that any part of the country where you get mealybugs, that's that white fuzzy thing that sucks your plants either up above or on the roots too sometimes. Um, any place that has mealybugs probably has crypt beetles, a.k.a. mealybug destroyers. Now, the beetle itself is barely half the size of the common lady beetle. This is a really small little guy. The shell is pretty much shiny black and it's an orange-red head that it has, so it really doesn't look too much like a lady beetle except for the shape. Okay, Shape is typical. And it has a dusty look to it. I'm not sure what causes that, but when you look at a crypt beetle, uh, he's, I guess it looks like he's got dust on him. <clears throat> anyway, the larva of that beetle, instead of looking like the classic ladybug larva, it looks like a giant mealybug. I mean, it is so much like a giant mealybug that the first time I ever saw them, I destroyed them. I felt so foolish. This is the 80-20 rule, right? No, went into action. We had mealies all over uh, Passiflora, passion vine, uh, edible passion fruits. Uh, they were all over in there. It was a mess. And I went, oh, my goodness. And then I looked, and I saw these little bit bigger and more aggressive-looking mealybugs. And I went, oh, my God, giant mealybugs, too. Ah! And so I went, and I got some oil spray, you know, and I just nuked the whole works with it, trying to get rid of all the mealybugs. And then somehow or another, I was doing a little bit of research on my issue, and suddenly it popped up that, oh, what I was killing it was probably about at least 10% of the bugs in those vines were not mealybugs. They were mealybug destroyer larvae. Um, yeah, the, uh, the larva of the crypt beetle looks like a great big mealybug. Um, the easiest way to tell the difference is there may be, you know, a third larger than a regular mealybug. Um, they're a little spikier looking. The stuff that comes off the sides is a little longer. Uh, and being that they're predators, they are more aggressive and they move a lot more. So they're much more active than the mealybugs themselves. Anyway, so there you have it, folks. I highly encourage you to educate yourself about insects and learn about this fascinating world of relationships between bugs because... They will really actually help you in the garden if you learn to tell the difference and are cautious about what you do with insects. Aloha, hang loose.